we'll give everybody a second to, uh, to kind of funnel in here. And then we'll take this thing off. Can you believe that uh, January is officially in our rearview mirror? This is our first show of February 2021. It's crazy. No, I, I can't. <sighs> time's flying. It's like COVID time is like times two or something. It's just flying. Well, look how fast last year went. I mean, it went slow, but then it really didn't go slow, did it? It seemed like it did, but it really wasn't. No, it seems a long time ago that uh, that first lockdown happened. That's for sure. We didn't have a 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Huh? It's, it's right over the floor in a hotel. <laughs> Let's just skip over it. <laughs> I, I, say things and then, I say things and then I go, oh, yeah, that was in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. We'll treat it like the 13th floor. That's going to be my new thing. It just didn't exist. Yeah, it's, it's funny to think, uh, I, I think it was beginning of March um, where I did my very last live event and we're creeping up on that. It's, it's hard to believe that was almost a year ago. It's like, wow. Shane, that was us. That was at what? my office. I, I know. <laughs> and yeah, I was I was kind of looking around going, hmm, this, this is getting a little dicey here. This may be the last one of these we have for a while. Yeah, I, I had already heard that some some uh, some of our uh, title comp title uh, other title companies had shut down live events, and I remember telling people at that event, "We have no plans to shut to stop live events." And yeah, literally two days later, <laughs> clip, that was it. Like, <laughs> that was it. Uh, nice. Well, hey, let's go ahead and roll in here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. Welcome to February of 2021. Um, this week, we have uh, Camille Johnson with us. I think a lot of you guys know Camille. Uh, she's going to be here to uh, chat a little bit about what she's seeing from her side of the industry, which is a little bit different perspective than ours uh, on the home warranty side. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into our, our kind of our normal thing here and then uh, turn it over to Camille as well. So uh, real quick, I'll uh, do my thing here. Um, you know what? I think I see a few new faces. So real quick, let's do some quick introduction, Shane. Uh, my name is Kirk Brewer. I'm the branch manager for Finance of America Mortgage, uh, the downtown Chandler branch to uh, be specific. I've uh, been doing this mortgage gig now for it'll be 20 years. Uh, I'm aging myself. I started in kindergarten. Um, 20 years doing mortgages uh, all here in the Southeast Valley in the state of Arizona um, this June. So I've been doing it a while. Um, and my, my partner in crime co-host Shane Sauer is right over there. Crime. <laughs> yes. Hey, and everybody. Uh, yeah, just a couple of new faces in here, which is awesome to see. Um, my name is Shane Sauer. I'm sales manager here at Greystone Title Agency. I am based out of uh, Chandler, but really I'm all over the whole the whole valley. Our corporate's up in Scottsdale, and I will be up there later today. I was up there a little bit yesterday, and I do get around. So no matter where you're at in the valley, um, we can help. So thank you for tuning in today. It's going to be fun. Absolutely. Let's jump right into it. Every week, I like to just give you guys a little bit of a, an overview of where rates are at, um, where they're trending, and just give you that. You guys are always getting asked by your clients, what are rates? What are rates? It's, it's just the nature of the beast. And while uh, nobody expects you to be uh, mortgage professionals, um, knowing where rates are at and how they're trending, I think is very important for you guys. And then, of course, if it's a more detailed uh, mortgage or rate related discussion, uh, you can always send them uh, my way, preferably, but uh, I know some of you guys already have uh, your preferred lenders, so send them to those folks. But let me share my screen real quick. Uh, nothing too exciting right now. Uh, as we've been talking about so far uh, here in 2020, um, there we go, 2021, pardon me. As we've been talking about, you know, now that we've had uh, the new administration inaugurated and there's been a, just a plethora of executive orders and policy changes, uh, I suspect we're going to see a shift in the markets. 
Uh, we have not seen the market pick a direction yet. Uh, there is some uh, upward movement uh, or pressure, I should say, for rates to move a little bit higher off of these lows. But so far, we've just been bouncing along these lows and uh, hasn't picked a direction whether it's going to stay here, go lower, or move higher. My hunch is short term, we'll probably start to see things move higher, uh, but we'll keep you updated uh, each week. Uh, so if you go to our website, thelongeeks.com, this is what the homepage looks like. And there's several ways you can get to rates here. I update the rates at least once a day, Monday through Friday, so you know they're current and they're accurate. Uh, the easiest way to get to them is just right here uh, up at the top of the page on the menu item. And that will take you to our rate page, which looks like this. And just go over these real quick. Uh, on a conventional 15-year fixed, we're still hanging right there at 2.375. We've been bouncing between 2.5 and 2.38. And uh, that's a par with no points. On a conventional 30-year fixed, we are still sitting at 2.875, and we've kind of been bouncing between two and three quarters and 3% uh, here for the last several months. And again, that's at par with no points. Um, on our government loans, on the 30-year fixed FHA, prices have come back down, and uh, those are nicely there at 2.875, and again, with no points. But that does include the, uh, the FHA funding fee. But uh, for those of you who have been with us week in and week out, you know, once the CARES Act hit, um, the government loans in particular had a lot of premium pricing. Those rates spiked and there was a lot of premium pricing built into those due to uh, forbearance concerns and things like that. Uh, and then on the VA, same deal, 30-year uh, fixed VA is running about two and seven eighths uh, with no points on that. And our jumbos are still sitting right there in the low threes uh, at par. Uh, those have moved up a little bit uh, once the uh, new administration had taken place, a little bit of uh, premium pricing in there just kind of due to an unknown market. So that's where we're sitting. Uh, like I said, we're, we're seeing some upward pressure in the bond markets, but not enough to start ticking these rates up yet. So we'll continue to monitor those for you guys uh, as the market kind of picks a direction. Um, did any of you guys happen to attend the Barry Habib event that uh, my company hosted yesterday? Uh, I know we sent out invitations uh, to a bunch of folks. Did you, Dana? You're on, you're on mute. Well, if, if you did, you know it was, it was a great event. Um, Barry is a wealth of knowledge. Um, I think I have a link. I may share that with you guys. Uh, I highly encourage you to watch it. Uh, do you know how to un unmute yourself, Dana? <laughs> <laughs> Technology is wonderful. There we go. There you go. Okay, I'm glad you guys can hear me, but my actual screen disappeared, so I can't see you. That's why I'm like, where did my screen go? <laughs> Technology. But anyway, yes, it was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm going to see if I can't send you guys a link to the recording. Um, it's 90 minutes. Um, the 90 minutes, number one, it flies by. Mm -hmm. um, Barry's a, an absolute wealth of knowledge, and he is probably one of the best forecasters of real estate markets in the industry. He's been doing a long time. He's highly respected. Um, and very well recognized for that. So I'll try and when I'm done here, uh, I'll try and put the link in our chat session uh, so you guys can get it. Um, it, it. Watch some of it if you can't sit down for the whole 90 minutes. I think it'll give you a really good perspective on where it looks like the market's going to be in 2021. And to sum it up uh, real quick, um, Life is good for us. Uh, it's going to be a really, really strong year for us, uh, both from uh, an interest rate perspective. They're going to stay low, even though we may see them go up a little bit. And there's going to still be this complete uh, seller's market, which there's, there's some bad side to that. But uh, from a demand perspective, our market's going to stay very, very hot. Um, and appreciation is going to continue uh, as well through this year. So I'll get that link out to you. Without further ado, though, I'm going to turn it on over to Shane and let him bring you up to speed on what he's seeing uh, here in the Valley with his data. Awesome. Take it away. Thanks, Kurt. And I was going to ask you too, what you were, 
what you were prognosticating as far as, as rates of you, what you've seen, but you kind of already alluded to that. But I was, that's always my first thing is what, what do you see down the line as far as where we're going with interest rate? Because short term, I, I could see us coming back up into the mid threes on a conventional 30 year fixed, which, you know, ooh, mid threes. Um, but I think, I know, right? Uh, but I think that could actually get some people off the fence who have also been, oh, I don't want to fight to get a house. But, you know, I hear it's really competitive out there. Uh, start moving up. That may get some of those buyers off the fence too. Uh, are we going to go up into the, the four? Probably not. But I think short term as the market's digesting what this new climate is going to look like, I could see us moving up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a hyper competitive year for, uh, for again, buyers and I think sellers too. I mean, uh, Lydia, you and I were talking about this just yesterday. What was a one listing for every 11 agents, something like that, that kind of a breakdown in numbers that you were sharing with me Ooh. yesterday. And that's interesting, you know, and, and so we need to find and be creative with other ways to, to get listings to, to, you know, and we desperately need them. So I want to share a couple of quick things, which I do every week. So let me see if I can get my, for some reason I can't, there it is. Okay, here we are. All right. Okay. Um, those of you who have been on know the market updates. Those, those of you who are new to the show, um, maybe you've not seen these before. If you'd like to start receiving them, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to hook you up with this. I'm going to bring up Chandler real quick as a quick example. Um, these come out on Wednesdays and get emailed right to you. You could share them on Facebook. You could you could email them out to your clients. You can put them on LinkedIn or Twitter or print them out and give them to prospective sellers or buyers or open houses. You can have them out. People pick this stuff up and we'll look at it. Um, this is the online version. This is the version that you'll get in your inbox. Um, the one you send out or share on Facebook, people have a little search bar. They can search on it. They can easily look at you know median list price. And this is all taken from the previous week. Uh, it's all compiled. I get these on Mondays. I put a little report together and then they go out to the agents on Wednesday, every Wednesday in the morning or in your inbox. I'm gonna show you median list price, median rent, which is something to really keep an eyeball on as well. Um, I, I find this interesting uh, to see where rents are going. You've got a little buyer seller index here, which in Chandler is pointing very much to the seller side. Um, the only, there's not many cities that are above this. Uh, I think Santan Valley is sitting at 97. Uh, out of 100, which is the highest I've seen here in the Southeast Valley and really, I think the whole valley, to be honest. Um, you've got a drop down menu here, so you can look at all kinds of cool different stuff here. Uh, it's very interactive. You can look back each week and kind of see where, where things were going or where they're at. Um, and you get a little snapshot of last week in Chandler in this case. And you can get any city or zip code in Arizona. Um, I'm going to show you new inventory. It's going to show you what was sold last week in Chandler. Um, average days on market. They did some changing around on this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something real quick here. Oh yeah, there's a little condo thing here. So you want condos too. So cool stuff. Um, I'm gonna show you something, and this is this is something. Kirk, did this come up? Okay, the Valley stats. Okay, all right. I'm gonna show you something that uh, they 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 I, I believe they changed in their algorithm. They changed something. So. When, when compiling this, and this I, every Monday when I get those reports in, I compile this one page sheet, which I share with an ever growing list of agents every Monday morning. Um, it, it's something you can I send it over to JPEG or a PDF. You could, you could share it with whoever you want. I, I, I'm, I'm totally fine with however you want to use this thing. It's going to give you just a quick snapshot of what's going on across the valley. Um, in one in one spot, but they did some changing around with average days on market, and I don't know what because these numbers don't make any sense to me. So I'm gonna see next week or Monday what that looks like again. Uh, but everything was like way down, and I'm like that that's not that something's wrong with that. Um, but I but I compiled it anyways. But what I wanted to kind of point out, and last week when we were talking about this thing. Uh, we were talking about the, kind of the slowing of the uh, uh, demise of the inventory. It looked like it was slowing a little bit. It was still going down, but the numbers weren't as great as the negatives. Um, that's, it looks like we're strapped back to the rocket again. Um, I'm seeing a big decline again in Phoenix, Scottsdale. These guys have been losing inventory dramatically since I started compiling this back in September. Um, the 
it's it's been stunning to watch uh, where we started with Phoenix and and um, I think both of them were over a thousand a thousand units Phoenix and Scottsdale I think Scottsdale or I think one of them was even at 1100 units and now they're you know Phoenix is under seven and Scottsdale's under six which is amazing Mesa was so far up there too at one time and now they're they're they've dropped quite a bit but it gives you a good glimpse and one shot of you know the cities across the valley. You can kind of compare them, look at things. You can look at this 90-day median. You can look at the seven-day and kind of see where deals could be made, where where prices are a little bit better, or they're on that decline or the increase. Um, and I also put a lot of secondary home destinations too, um, up in the White Mountains through Flag. So you can kind of look at what's going on up there as well. Um, it just gives you a quick snapshot, like I said, uh, Monday morning. If you're drinking your coffee, maybe this is something you want to take a look at and and like, wow, that's amazing. Or, you know, it, it, to me, it is. I, I love numbers. I love looking at this stuff and uh, I love to share. A um, couple of quick things. Um, the market index, seeing, seeing a big hit to the buy, you know, going more to the buyer side in Apache Junction and then Tempe on the way up again, more towards the seller's market, but they've been down quite a bit. Um, yeah, there's Santan Valley at 97 again. And they've been up, I think, as high as 98, but they keep bouncing right around 98, 97, 96. Very, very hot seller's market in Santan Valley. I mean, but then again, what isn't a hot market here in the Valley right now? Any listing is going super fast. Um, and a lot of them before they're even hitting the market, which is amazing. But um, if you like this or anything else we could do, I mean, marketing is what I do at, at, at Greystone and I love to share. So... Um, again, I'd love to chat about this. Uh, is there a link? Oh, is that the, uh, is that, is that the link you posted, Kurt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks like it's good. I think Lau, uh, Eric had checked it out and, uh, it looks good. Again, I highly encourage you guys to watch it. Um, bot bottom line is the market's going to stay hot. Get your buyers off the sideline. If they think things are going to get better this year or next um, it's not looking that way. There is a huge demographic uh, that is getting ready to become home buyers that hadn't been yeah. previously based on birth rates going back literally 33 years ago. And then you couple that with there's going to be a spike in birth rates. Um, imagine that. People have been locked down together for the past uh, going on 12 months. Um, so there's going to be a spike in birth rates. And guess what? The number one statistic is to convert people from renters to homeowners, birth of a first child. So it's not going to be slowing down anytime soon. So get your buyers buying, uh, get in them, get them in there, get them fighting. And with rates down where they're at, affordability, they're not, even though prices are going up, uh, homes are actually more affordable at these rates. So why that if you guys get a chance. It's very, very informative. Well, we, we have a new segment to our show. Yes, we do. We, we have uh, we have Camille Johnson from uh, One Guard Home Warranty here with us with uh, what we're going to make a staple of the show, I, hopefully monthly or bi-monthly or however we can work it out, but a little home warranty corner, some tips, some cool stuff from you, Camille, is that the kind of where we're going? That's it. I love it. It's going to be awesome. Home warranty is so exciting. You know, it's actually super interesting if you look at 2020 and home warranty, because until we went through it, we had no idea what we were going to be up against. But as you can imagine, with everyone being at home, everything failed more quickly. So we've never had more refrigerator claims ever because everyone's opening their fridge, you know, <laughs> 10 times a day instead of four, or maybe it's 25 times a day, but <laughs> we're losing, you know, when you open your fridge, you lose that coolness. So we've been, been replacing a lot of compressors on the refrigerators, but even, you know, some people don't use their ovens as often as they are now. Microwaves, you flush your toilet more, you use your sink more. So we had like a 40% increase in our work orders starting in about April and it went through most of the year. And then hottest summer on record. So that added a whole other layer of more AC claims than we've ever had. 
And interestingly, a lot of our, we did have initially some contractors who did not want to go into homes anymore. So mm -hmm. first hurdle, you know, that one guard really had to figure out was we need more contractors. Now we have more work orders, but now we have people who don't want to go in other people's homes. So you can see it just created a, a difficult situation, but we persevered and we got through it. And now I know that, you know, we can do anything if we can get through since we got through 2020. Now our contractors basically, for the most part, are back. Um, still a lot of claims in general, and you probably know this if you've looked at any new builds with your clients, it's really hard to get appliances right now. Have any of you seen that? I mean, builders are like, the home is done, but they are six weeks lagging, right? On getting the fridge and oven and whatever it may be. So in the home warranty industry, that has been killing all of us. It is such a long wait. And who wants to wait for weeks for a new washer or dryer or dishwasher, right? And it's something that's been completely out of our control. We've offered, obviously we offer cash in lieu of the repair, but that doesn't really help. People will say, well, okay, you're gonna give me 2000 for my oven, but I can't find anywhere to buy an oven any faster than you can, which is true. So, but it's been good in the way that the homeowner realizes, you know, we say, hey, you call Spencer's, call Home Depot, ask them how long it'll be till you can get this and then decide if you want one guard to do it or if you want to do it yourself. And most of them realize, okay, I'm, I'm just going to stick with the home warranty because it really is hard. It's, it's really been a dilemma and something we've realized as a home warranty company if this is going to continue to happen, or if we have a situation like this again, how are we more prepared? You always want the latest and greatest of all the appliances. So it's not like you can store them. You know, it's, it's just interesting. It's things you don't think about if you're not in this industry, but it's been really interesting just to see how it's all happened. We, you know, we never could have foreseen the amount of claims simply because of people being home. Yeah. Well, and, and we've been talking about uh, on the show for months. I mean, probably since its inception, um, especially once we kind of realized that there's a shift taking place. And I think coming out of COVID, whenever that is, a, you know, whenever you can designate that officially, there's going to be a lot more people working from home, period. And there's going to be a lot of companies, mine included, that is going to divest themselves of a lot of commercial, expensive commercial real estate. And so how's that impacting your business? Are we going to see home warranty rates go up? Have they already gone up? Um, what, what are we looking at? Uh, what are you thinking we're going to see going forward? And by the way, and the follow-up to that is, should all of us as existing homeowners consider getting a home warranty for ourselves? Great, great questions. So 2020, probably our best sales year we've ever had. And it, it's because now that people are home more and they realize they're using everything more, a home warranty has become even more valuable. And so I think we're gonna continue to see that. If you're home working in the summer, you're gonna keep your house a lot cooler, right? Because commercial buildings, they stay nice and cool. They're 75. Well, you keep your house at 75 in the day. It obviously is going to cost a lot more money, but it's also going to put a lot more, um, not pressure. I can't think of the word. Just Brain. more wear and tear Brain. on your HVAC yeah. systems. Yeah. So yeah. I think in general, we will continue to see, and not just our real estate clients, but our general consumer, you know, just homeowners, we have so many more orders coming from them because now they see the expense of how much it is to repair things. We are not anticipating a price increase this year, which I'm really happy about, but I have seen a lot of our competitors prices have gone up because I've seen the new brochures that they're producing right now. That may have to happen with, with the scarcity of appliances, the cost of appliances is going up significantly. So with that cost, 
it's just going to cost us more to replace something. And so the wholesale rates will go up as well. So you're right, Kirk, at some point, you know, it may be after this year, we're trying, one guard's trying to keep our prices where they are for a while. And, but it's demand, right? As we get much more demand, we know that we can raise prices and need to raise prices in order to provide the same level of service. Well, you, you've you even seen some of your competitors out there, their service plans, uh, they're dropping stuff off. They're not doing what they did. Um, yeah. For the same and, amount of money. Yeah, for the same amount. I mean, I, I, I happily got a one guard plan a few years ago and never realized all my cool Samsung appliances would just like crap out one after another. <laughs> but, I told Shane two years ago, I you said, me and I, didn't like, I love Samsung. And I said, They're so Shane, cool. <laughs> I'm going to give you two years and your ice maker is not going to work. <laughs> again. Yeah. Again. Yeah. It does, it, but uh, yeah, it's been, we're not going to get any sponsorships from Samsung. That no, no. <laughs> okay. They we're look cool. GE. But you GE, know what? Uh, Any, Whirlpool. Anyone in general, we even had GE has let us know they're they're basically making things to last five to seven years yeah think about your grandma's washer right or i have a fridge in my that's like 20 years old in my garage my inside garage which is the ge monogram which is a beautiful fridge i had to replace the compressor i've never had to replace the compressor in my outside fridge which is in a lot hotter environment right so it's be they're actually being made to last not last you know they make more money on parts when they're a, and new appliances same with hvac systems people are so surprised these brand new hvac systems they're 2016 2017 they're already needing major repairs we never had that with our older units you had a good five to ten yeah. years before you even needed anything and now within three four years you need a new compressor on the ac so that, that's going to take a toll on home warranty. It really is just the yeah. amount of replacements that we're going to have. All the disposable appliances. Right? But I was going to say, and I don't know, is that, can you even <laughs> relate that to made in America versus not made in America? Is it just quality of craftsmanship? I, I know there's no such thing as a stainless steel uh, uh, home appliance anymore. It's all actually like brushed aluminum, yeah. not even stainless steel. It's crazy yeah, and, and if you want real stainless steel you got to go full-blown commercial grade and that's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars right i mean people will pay we have some homes in paradise valley their refrigerators are vikings they're 14 fifteen thousand yeah. dollars yeah those so are gonna last but so, so wait a minute you're saying my cool samsung black stainless appliances aren't really black stainless what? They're what? No. You have really <laughs> no. crushed me, sir. <laughs> Sand it down and you'll find the white. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, we've all had to rethink our industry and what we do and how we promote. And instead of, we've got to pivot, right? When things come in our way. And that's what we've all done all year. Yeah. And we'll continue to do, I guess. Well, it's 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 a whole different perspective on on our industry that uh, I think is is super valuable that a lot of people don't think about, and uh, you know we we need to factor that in on for all of us how we're doing business, whether it's in our business or our home life. So, um, I'll so that does bring me. That brings me to a question. So I have a probate coming up to sell, but the wife, it's a second marriage. So it has to go through probate because the home is only in his name and he passed away. So her first question to me was, or I asked her, I said, are you going to leave the appliances? And she said, yes, I'm going to just buy new ones. So now maybe I'm rethinking this and I should probably <laughs> tell her to take her appliances <laughs> or order the appliances now, even though we don't even have the house yet. It's, I'm not kidding. It is months. It is, yeah, it is. I talked to an agent who said there's all these home builders who are just slowing their process because they know the appliances are going to hold them up. So That's why are they hurrying on the framing and everything else? 
Well, and that ties into this link from Barry's meeting yesterday too. Um, people are buying homes further out. The new home builders are getting further and further behind uh, because people are, are going ahead and, and buying that house that's not going to be even started for six months. They're going to go ahead today to buy it. Um, Lumber is going to continue to be in a shortage. Concrete is going to continue to be in a shortage. Um, and the prices of all that is going up anyway. Right. Because the demand. Precisely. Right? Demand and price. Precisely. So uh, there's there's no let up in sight for the, the short term. That's that's for sure. And we should factor uh, that in when we're advising our clients. Has anybody noticed? I, I just have to bring this up because it just pisses me off. We have a fiduciary responsibility to our clients. I have had calls from agents who had another agent who actually was gung ho to sell their home. And they sold it in a nanosecond. And now they need some place to move to because now that agent can't find them a home. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and your agent didn't tell you to go buy a home first or go put a contract in first? Because as soon as you put a contract in, you could put your house on the market and do a simultaneous close. That won't be the issue because you'll get 50 contracts in about three hours. So I, I am hearing this more and more. I'm pissed that real estate agents are so gung-ho to sell the house with this probate situation that I met with the gal. She's like, well, you know, I've got these issues with the house and do you think I need to do this and this? And I go, honestly, you probably don't even have to fix those things and you'll still get over asking. But <clears throat> I said, I said, selling your house isn't going to be the issue. It's going to be buying your house. And she goes, oh, it is? I go, yes, we need to find you a house first before we list your house. Yes, am I gung-ho to sell her house? Absolutely, but I don't wanna leave her homeless either. Are you having problems though? I see that all the time. Um, I've got some rental properties, which I rented out for minimal, minimum one year lease, but I get phone calls all the time. Hey, can I rent your property for six months or three months or whatever? We are willing to pay this much extra. And I said, you know, I would love to help you, but sorry, we only rent for uh, one year. So yes, it's happening all the time. Dana, you had a comment? Yeah, I was just saying that, do you have a problem with people wanting to accept your offer when the other house hasn't closed? Because that's what I would be concerned with. Um, and the other thing that I have found is that um, when people are bringing in offers, if, <laughs> If you don't take the first offer, but you you know go over a weekend so that you get several offers, um, I find that there are people who come in and say, okay, you know we'll buy the house. We've got a you know they're offering a great price, and we'll give you an additional thirty days to stay in the house, so you can find something. Yes, but sometimes oh I, I agree with that because I have had post possession, mm -hmm. but I just got a call from an agent that a lender gave her, it's the lender that she's using. And she, he said, call Lydia, she'll help you with the short-term rental. So she tells me that her agent sold her house in Gold Canyon and they haven't been able to find a house. And she needs a short-term rental for her and her husband and her grandson and her two dogs. And I said, after listening to her, I go, and your real estate agent didn't tell you that you'd have a hard time buying a house and they sold your house before you finding a house and there were chirps, mm -hmm. nothing was said. And mm -hmm. she said, no. And I said, every single real estate agent should educate you on what is going in the market, not just for the sale, but for the buy as well. Mm -hmm. And she's been looking for over, so she closes on the 22nd and has no place to move to mm -hmm. of this month with some real estate agent that can't find her a house. That's interesting because, you know, as, as a lender, I, I would almost take that for granted that an agent is giving that advice that, you know, before we list your house, because it's going to sell quick, the agent should know if it's going to stay on the market, if, if they're willing to price it properly and it's going to show well, um, you know, what's your exit strategy? Where, where are you going when we yeah. sell your house? That should be the natural question. So, who are these agents that aren't 
Because, like, I, I don't know if that technically falls under the f- true fiduciary side of things. My goodness, it definitely falls under professional. My broker said it is a fiduciary responsibility because everybody wants the easy way, right? We all want listings. There's one listing for every one listing. There's 11 agents that don't have one. So if you have three listings, there are 33 agents without a listing. So listings are the thing right now, right? Who is the one that's going to go out and take those clients out and, and go over and over and over? I have a client that we put multiple offers in cash deal over asking, not asking for anything, paying all the fees. I mean, we're doing everything right. And we got one of 75 offers. Now, granted, that one is only like a 220 price range. So that range is really difficult. But even in the higher ranges, you're still seeing, I went and looked at $400,000 houses and they had 23 offers. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Maybe I don't understand the game, but I would think you're working to to uh, to get a referral from your client down the road and doing them a <laughs> solid by explaining every option. And I, I, you know, maybe I don't understand how this works, but yeah, when you leave people out and living in a tent on the side of the road, that's probably not going to net you a referral down the road. It's Absolutely, it's my thought. But well, I would say if you are if you have a listing you are in driver's seat, uh, you can have some sort of uh, agreement with the buyer, you know, post-possession, uh, seller can stay in the house a little bit longer reasonably mm-hmm. um, and, and try to make it as easy as possible for your um, seller. Yes, but this yeah. agent did not do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, no, that's wrong. That, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Or at least, you know, go with a longer close of escrow. If, I mean, right now, a buyer can't, Right? What are they going to say? No, it's got to be 30 days. Well, then we won't sell it to you. We'll sell it to the next yeah. guy. Um, if well, you and- new house, you're 12 months out. So Right. And Kurt, don't you have, like, don't the lenders have bridge? So if they can't afford to buy the home until they sell the home, I totally get that. But don't they have those bridge loans or something that you can do on a temporary basis to get those people into a house? Isn't there some <laughs> sort of structure you can do? Or does it depend... Is it a case by case situation? It's case by case. Um, yeah, bridge loans aren't really as in vogue as they they had been in the past. Oh. Um, not a lot of folks are are doing them since the previous housing crisis we had. Um, the fact okay. of the matter is, you know, if if you can get an equity line and take the equity out, it's it's the equivalent. There's got to be equity there. Um, right. Get an equity line, take it out, but you you. You're gonna have to qualify for all of that debt, um, you know. That that was the thing. Typically, a bridge loan is they're gonna let you uh, temporarily have some expanded debt ratios. Uh, right. It's a very specialized product. Okay. Awesome. Good. Good conversation. Good stuff. Um, boy, I didn't think for for a second there was agents out there. Uh, selling somebody's home without knowing what their plan is. I had talked to somebody, was it you and I talking last, last week, Shane? Or is this, oh, it was, you were talking about, it was Dan, wasn't it? He went and sold his house. And didn't yeah, know. yeah, my boss. And he, he left out and found us. Found it all okay. the he did? Yeah, he did. I, I'm like, I don't know how he did it, but. That's shocking. I was asking yeah. anybody if they have listings coming up, you know, because I'm like, He's never going to fight it. Well, we'll just live in an apartment and then we, we're going to take our time. And then he found something like within a couple weeks after selling his house. I'm like, you you put your market, house in the market. He got a contract in like two days. Of course he did. You know, I'm darn like, lucky. Yeah, yeah. yeah, really lucky. Yeah. Uh, Mike yeah. Abel video that went viral. Yes. Um, that was interesting. That was an interesting uh, event last week for those who were on and um, those who saw the video maybe afterwards because it was shared around and was made public. Yeah, Mike uh, Mike was on the soapbox, the proverbial soapbox last week about the whole right. NAR code of ethics, the changes to the free speech and all that. Um, we even talked about that. We had a we had a meeting yesterday where Lydia was on too. We, Mike was on with us and he kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, if anyone would like it, it was about an hour long, I think. Um, 
all in all, with uh, was our Friday meeting from last Friday, and we had Mike Abel, who's our corporate counsel and vice president, on talking about just that the NAR Code of Ethics, the changes to Article 10 in the Code of Ethics, dealing with uh, uh, hate speech and harassing speech, and basically what that you can't say a word anymore. Um, it was uh, an interesting meeting, and I knew that Mike, well, Mike likes that kind of stuff anyway. And he, yeah, he is like a dog looking for a bone in a backyard when it comes down to things that deal with censorship and really government uh, yeah. in, in a nutshell. And this is one of those things where he, well, we're going to have him on probably uh, not this month, but maybe next month with maybe an update to that to see if anything's been done because there are fines and there's all kinds of stuff being levied, but we haven't heard of anything yet but um, that could change by next month and we're hey Shane, i i heard mike's uh you know mike's opinions last week mm -hmm. i mean he had some very good points but at the same time it seemed like the pendulum swung a little bit far um that's just my sense but w honestly what do you think i could be wrong in which regard raj yeah mike mike abel yeah, when, when he said, I mean, he said we cannot say anything, we got to keep our mouth shut. Yeah. I thought that was a bit too extreme. Um, you know, here's, yeah. here's my take. If they put those rules in place uh, without getting comment from you guys and your local boards, um, and then they put very strict penalties in place, mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, those rules are subjective. That's that's really the that's the problem. So who who's determining when you violate that? Yeah, strictly my personal opinion, but they'll use it when it suits them to use it. Yeah, <laughs> of course, it won't be uniform across the board, uh, or at least there will be somebody who will be getting away with doing something, and then somebody who's going to get in trouble for doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where it really is scary when it's dealing with your livelihood. Um, that's really what Mike was trying to communicate. Um, they're saying, oh, unless it's weaponized. Well, def define weaponized in, in, in yeah. view. So that's really, I think, what he was trying to communicate is, um, how about some well-defined, if you're going to ch change the rules, how about well-defined rules? Here's the words you can and can't say. Here's the context you can and can't say them within. Um, and, and once they cross professional duties into your personal life, uh, I, I think that's where he had a, a real big concern as, as well. Um, yeah. I so mean, it might be interesting. We, do, we don't know what their intent with this thing was. Maybe it's just uh, to, to appear uh, politically correct in today's environment. We don't know. Yeah, Mike, Mike could be, a, I'm not saying Mike can't be an extremist on things, but it really is sounding the, the 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 siren here to alert you to this now he talked about even yesterday at our in a meeting we had early in the morning he talked about you know uh people video t you know using their phone to record somebody if they saw somebody at a restaurant and and which could happen i mean well, I you see it all the time you see it all the time oh, on yeah. social media i met with an agent the other day for lunch and we got on the subject of politics and it's like okay there you go I mean, that could be taken as harassing speech to somebody who doesn't agree with those views, you know, to be honest. I, I, where does it end? And if you have been able to go in and look at the um, at Article 10, um, the new standards of practice, it's uh, uh, Section 10.5 on here. And it does say realtors must not use harassing speech, hate speech, epithets, or slurs based on race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Um, it's very clear, and um, that it means talking or posting or anything, and I'm like, yeah, that's kind of putting the clamps on a little bit, but uh, Mike is, yeah, Mike. Uh, Mike yeah, but I don't think, to be honest, I don't think any of us or most of us don't talk like that anyway, so it's not really going to be an issue for us, is, yeah. is what I think he's saying is that, you know, I, I'm not saying that there isn't people that do that, but I mean, most real estate agents don't have that even in their thoughts. So it's not even like verbiage that comes out of their mouth, even on their personal, um, in their personal life. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're like me, I mean, I, I don't post 
political or religious right. or anything. It's like, I don't want to offend anyone, honestly. Uh, like Mike said, the only color I see is green, right? I mean, that's the only color there is. So it's like, you don't offend anyone really. You try to walk. I mean, if I'm with somebody personally and we go to talk about something, that's a whole nother thing. But to put something on Facebook is a little, you know, right. but it did come up. I did have an agent who shared a post with somebody and they, that person got offended and called her up and, and, and reamed her out and then contacted her board and um, like, wow. wow. So it's real. I mean, um, so it's just being careful. I think Mike, uh, Mike likes to scare people. Well, there always is You know, the one person who gets, you know, we all know that that person who gets offended at everything. Yeah. And um, yeah. Well, and, and again, yeah, especially in our professional lives, right? I don't think anybody who takes their, their profession seriously um, is, is even, you know, in their professional lives going to even tell an off color joke. Right. I mean, we're, we're, it's it's business. We're here to conduct business. Um, but, you know, one of the messages I took away from Mike's, Mike's thing is, you know, I mean, our, our, our country was founded on opposing views and, and heated debate and, and quite frankly, the right to offend somebody. <laughs> OK, you have the right to offend somebody. It's not a mortal wound and they have the right to walk away or even give you the bird or whatever. and. and and walk away and we're heading into an environment where that is being uh, uh, silenced and stifled. And so for the board to go out of your professional lives, which they have a, a, a right to tell you how you conduct yourself professionally and, and cross that over into your personal lives, uh, th that's an interesting, it's gonna be interesting. You know, it'd be interesting yeah. to come back here uh, periodically and keep updated on this is there going to be a guinea pig where they actually go and and you know impose these penalties on somebody who was found to have violated that policy you know, uh, it seems see how it evolves from, from some of the things he said it sounded like you know you could be having a conversation with you know a friend who happens to be an agent or maybe they're not an agent or whatever you're just talking to them and maybe you're talking about your faith or your, you know, your differences in your faith, or it, mm -hmm. it sounds like that could actually be something that you could yeah. lose your, your job out of, yep. oh, you know? It's, well, there are some controversial parts of that, right? Mm -hmm. As far as like same-sex marriage and, and transgender nature and all those pronouns and stuff, certain people's re religions, are, they're adamantly opposed to those things. And so, there, there's areas to get offended within there um, where you're, you're not intending to harm anybody, but yet it's taken a, a, as offensive. So um, it, it, was a, it was an interesting discussion last week. And uh, I think we're gonna continue to have these debates going forward based on what I'm seeing uh, in some headlines in the news. Um, so we'll, we'll see how this, this topic evolves with, uh, uh, with NAR as well. The other thing that's happening right now too is the Dodd Frank is coming. Not Dodd Frank, but I mean the um, partners between lenders and title companies and real estate offices um, are starting to be looked at again. And they're uh, RESPA. At RESPA, and they're also looking. At, and I was told because I have a servicing account, um, I was told that that they are coming after the servicers that have screwed around with their people on these forbearances. So some of these servicing companies are gonna get hefty fines for what they've done to, you know, in the beginning when they did all these forbearances, there was no documentation. They just put them automatically. You called up the bank and they said, you know, don't, um, you know, if they even said, what's a forbearance, they put them on it right away. So. And I had a meeting with um, uh, Freddie Mac, the director of Freddie Mac in Washington, D.C. And he said they finally had to, he said they, in the beginning, they let the servicing in the banks. Um, they kind of gave them, you know, go help your people because of COVID. And then they found out that some of the servicing companies and a lot of them were doing this where they weren't um, doing what was best for their 
customers. And so then they had to put tighter reins on them. So that came from the director of Freddie Mac. And then they had to say very specific, you know, they had to have documentation and they had to have these rules had to be in place. And so that's when that changed a couple months later. But in the beginning, they weren't doing that. So a lot of those guys are going to get their hands slapped from, um, from the um, for, CFPB. For not, yeah. Yeah, well, with the new administration change, right? They're putting a, a new head of the CFPB in who's going to be more yeah. like Andre was, which is he's going to be much more aggressive going after people and kind of regulate by fines and penalties kind of thing. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. Again, there's going to be so many shifts that are, that are going to be taking place. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for these servicers because, you know, CARES Act came out and they couldn't get paid, but they had to keep paying the mortgage, but they weren't getting paid from the client. Right. And maybe they thought they were doing the right thing, which is, hey, if somebody says forbearance, get them on, right? Because of COVID and right. it'll be interesting how that shakes out too. Uh, but and, I, and, there's gonna and be the fines. Thing, yes, and the sad thing is, is that real estate agents are not educating themselves on what these issues are. And so now we're gonna come up to a whole big issue and then they're gonna say, when did this happen? Why did this happen? Well, it happened a year ago. Why? I mean, I didn't even know what a forbearance was until I have a relationship with the uh, with the uh, um, Mid First Bank, and the gal sends me people when there's when they don't have a real estate agent. So she called me up and said, "Oh my gosh, I was just on a phone call with my corporate. Don't let your clients or don't let your friends call their bank and say anything about a forbearance." And I go, "Well, what's a forbearance?" She goes just tell them not to say it or call them or do anything. And she said, and I'll call you later and tell you what it is. And I'm like, okay. And I didn't even know what it was until I started seeing some of my, um, the servicing um, inspections coming in around July-ish. And then I have a mastermind group every, every other Monday and it's agents that are outside of the state. And I, I started in on my soapbox about these, um, uh, forbearances and the, the agents were like we don't even know what that is so I had to explain to them what's a forbearance and why agents need to be concerned about if people are exiting their forbearance without an exit strategy because my servicing company called me last week and we got 27,000 BPOs from just one of our customers and they were all forbearance late so if people don't know that foreclosures are coming, everybody laughed in my face back in July and they said, oh, everybody's got equity. No one's going to go to foreclosure. BS is what I say to that because people don't know that they have equity and people don't know how to get out of their, don't know what they got into with forbearances, don't know how to get out of them. And we agents are the ones that need to educate them. Well, and, and this is a... Shane, hop in here, man. We've been talking about this for months and months and months. Put it this way. Everybody who's been here, they know what a forbearance is. Mm -hmm. And shame on any agent who, who has not been following the CARES Act and the ramifications. Absolutely. Right? I agree with that. Um, but the $64 million question is, you guys as agents, how do you get to all of these people? You don't have the resources to do it. We don't have resources to, unless you want to start posting TV commercials, well, nobody watches TV anymore. So Netflix commercials, um, you know, and, and doing a massive advertising campaigns, which by the way, should be the responsibility of the lenders who are putting these people in forbearance. I agree. They should not be going to foreclosure as we've talked about for months, because even those people who went in at three and a half percent down on an FHA, a year ago, they have equity today, like we talked about to start the show, and they're going to have more equity a year from now. And so anybody who's stripping them of that equity in a foreclosure or God forbid it's uh, offer pad or offer door and those guys, shame on them. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. So I have a friend that's in the senior industry and a few weeks ago, she was looking at doing a um, refi. So she called up her bank, I think it was Sun America or something like that. And she, call, she called them up and 
she said, well, I was told I can't do a, a, a refi because she had just done one like in September. So she has to wait till May to do a new one, which I don't know the rules on that, but she can't do a streamlined refi, another streamlined refi until May. A week ago, she finds out that she might get laid off. So she calls them back and she says, can I do a forbearance or oh, I'm, I'm possibly going to lose my job. The lady clicks up and says, will you qualify for a forbearance and we can do a three month forbearance. And she remembers her friend Lydia talking about forbearance in a bad way. So she says, well, tell me what I have to do. And she said, well, she said, you get three months of no payments. And then on month four, you owe it all back. And she said, I can't do that. And she said, most people can't do that. So she said, um, so she said, what happens is she said, so now we day four or month four, we give you your payment and then a little bit more just because you have to make up that those three months, right? So she calls me up because she knows I know everything about forbearances. And this is what she says. So here's what I think I'm going to do, Lydia. She goes, and I need your advice. She goes, I'm going to do a forbearance February, March, and April. And then I'm going to refi in May. And I go, oh, no, you're not. I said, you are not going to refi in May if you are doing a forbearance in January, February, March. And I said, here's the other thing. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to be your friend now, not your real estate agent. I said, you can't afford your $1,700 house payment now. What makes you think in day month four or month four that you're going to be able to make your $2,200 payment? Because now you have to add on, tack on the extra money that you didn't pay for the last three months. I said, if I were you, because she lives alone, I said, you have two extra bedrooms and an extra bathroom. I would get a short-term renter in there and I would, I would rent out those rooms. I said, I know you don't want to, but find a college student, find a family that's stuck, that needs to buy a house or do something and put them in there and let them help you make your house payment for a few months. Lydia, and I, I have a said, question for you. Yeah. Uh, isn't forbearance, what I've heard is that uh, whatever you owe, whatever missed payments are there, you don't owe right away, but it can be lumped at the um, end of the loan. So, so it's say, all new, give it, an example. It, so let's say you have an outstanding mortgage balance of 200,000 and then you okay. missed three, three months of payments, 2000 each. So that's 6,000 and whatever fees or penalties may be. So that six or seven or 8,000 gets lumped into the loan. And then when the loan is due, all of that is due. Uh, and the government gives you one year, 12 months, uh, of missed payments. Is that true or not? So Kurt probably knows better than I do, but it is all negotiable. So it's how you set it up ahead of time. And that is why these people in the very beginning of last year did not have anything set up. So one of my servicing calls way back in July, I was taking a photo of a house because they make me go and it's outside inspections and I have to see is it occupied, has it been vacant, are they maintaining their outside, is the grass look like it's dying, those kinds of things. So I'm out there taking photos and this woman drives up very slow and she goes, why are you taking a photo of my house? And I said, well, I work for the servicing company and this is one of my assignments. And she goes, what's a servicing company? And I said, that is the person who takes care of your mortgage. And she goes, oh, she goes, does this have something to do with the forbearance I did? And I said, I, I don't know, they don't tell me, but it very well could. She goes, well, let me tell you my story. She said, my husband lost his job back in, I don't know, February, March, when COVID first came here. And, and so they called their bank and they gave them a, um, a, a, a um, forbearance and then two weeks later, he got a really good job and made more money, but didn't bother calling them to try to get out of their forbearance at that time. So here this whole three months or whatever time frame they had. And then the forbearance was done and they had to pay 10 or $12,000 to get themselves back in. So what did they do? They sold their house to open door. And I said, unfortunately, you left money on the table. And she goes, we know we did, but she said we were desperate. So I will tell you, people do not know what they got themselves into, and they do not know how to negotiate these. Forbearances are short-term loan modifications. If you don't know how to negotiate a short-term loan modification, you should not be doing it because you don't know what you're getting yourself into. 
Yeah. Is that about, it, is that about right, it, Kurt? Yeah, yeah, it part, mostly, mostly. Yeah, I, I would say a couple, couple things um, to, to add to that is all of my knowledge is, is that the uh, coming out of the forbearance, the plan to come out of forbearance is not negotiated when you go in. I don't know any servicers that are negotiating the exit, uh, at least not during the heat of, of the CARES Act and COVID when people were going in. They were in just putting in. In the beginning, right. And, and then you need to negotiate coming out. And now what I've heard, and, and if you guys follow that link I put in the chat with Barry, he, he talks about this as well. Uh, he has a much bigger national picture uh, uh, of the industry, and he deals with a lot of servicers, and he actually gets to interact with a lot of the regulators as well. Um, what is likely going to be the overwhelming majority is most servicers are not going to uh, foreclose on these people. They're, they're not going to make them come up with a lump sum. What they're going to do is essentially kind of back during the last housing crisis, when people did loan mods and there was this uh, differential amount that they, they owed um, or, or folks who did a short sale too and there was this differential amount they owed, um, what they'll do is they'll basically carry a side note and that side note will be due and payable when they sell the house or if they're done paying the mortgage then they'll start paying that. Um, but it's, it's up to each servicer. The CARES Act didn't contain specificity on how to come out of these forbearances that they required servicers put people in. Um, this regulation creates more problems than it solves most times. Um, and they did it with the best of intentions. But how would you like to be the poster child servicer that gets plastered on the front page of every newspaper and every evening news program, if any of you guys watch that stuff anymore, um, that you're the servicer that's forbear or foreclosing on these poor homeowners who suffered because of COVID and were laid off. Um, probably not the position you wanna be in um, and then have the regulator coming after you. So I, I, I don't think that's gonna be their first option, but um, how do we educate these people? Again, $64 million question. How do we educate the people that are in forbearance? The, for, the best people to do it are the servicers because they know who they are. Right. Uh, but Freddie, Freddie Mac said in that meeting, and Tina Tempor was in that meeting with me, and she called me after and said, oh, my gosh. And I said, oh, yes, this is what I'm dealing with. So I said to her, in that meeting, the, the director in Washington, D.C. said to all of us on that call, you go out and educate your customers. You go out and educate your homeowners. And I'm like, what the heck? We didn't start this crap, you guys did. So, so one thing that I think every single person should do on this call and every single agent in the Valley needs to get in their own database and make some sort of an email and say, if you or someone you know did a forbearance, contact me for um, options. Their options are pay it back and do a refi and lower their house payment. Um, the option, another option would be to rent it out, go live with a family member and rent their house out. Another one would be to sell the house. I mean, there's all kinds of options to help these people get out of their forbearance without leaving them homeless. So we need to do it to our own database first. Yeah, and I think that's probably the most reasonable uh, within all of our customers. I know I've sent out, uh, I haven't so far this year, but I sent out a couple of uh, my clients, just letting them know, hey, look, forbearance isn't this magic thing that's going to save you. Uh, proceed with caution, and if you have any questions, call me. Um, I think that's a, a wise approach that we should all take is at least uh, reach out to them and give them an opportunity because we're not going to get everybody, but all of us on this call and anybody who watches us after the fact, um, I think we do owe it to our clients, um, especially, you know, those of us who approach our business as a long-term relationship with our clients uh, to at least reach out and, and let them know, hey, we're a resource. They shouldn't just magically think, hey, I owe $20,000 and I can't pay it tomorrow. Uh, I need to go sell my house, you know, 
to, to one of these uh, I, I buyer companies uh, and right. walk away from all this equity. Um, yeah, point, point well taken. Well, guys, we are way over today, but uh, pleasantly so. Uh, I love it when uh, we have great discussions about relevant topics like this. So um, let's table this till next week and uh, pick it back up. Real quick, uh, next week we've got Patrick McQueen with us. Um, Patrick will be talking about uh, some of the updates to uh, the, uh, the the eviction uh, moratorium. Oh, um, yeah, that'll be good. We're going to follow up with an event with him on the 17th. We'll have him with us for an hour long seminar. So um, looking forward to having Patrick with us again. He's always delightful. So should be uh, should be a great show. Yeah, don't miss Patrick. Uh, he, he, again, he's, he's a wealth of knowledge, uh, especially when it comes to how COVID impacts you guys uh, with your rentals and your short-term rentals, for sure. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks. It's great to see you guys. Thank you. Again, we really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, if you guys have any buyers, uh, <laughs> it's, it's tough out there for them, but if you have any buyers and they need a good lender to get pre qualified with, uh, shoot him my way. I'd love to help him. Uh, and I know Shane, he, he always, always loves it when he sees Greystone written on a contract. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll Thanks, see everyone. everybody next week.